welcome to West Sussex and to the village of Hurstpier Point, which is a few miles to the north of Brighton. We are in the village centre, which is a large venue for all manner of events, including, on this occasion, any questions, and the venue is packed. On our panel, Stuart Andrew is Vice Chairman of the Conservative Party, Emily Thornbury is the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Sarah Olney took Zach Goldsmith's seat in a by-election which he triggered, and thus she became a Lib Dem MP for all of five months, until Theresa May called this snap election. And Nigel Farage is... Nigel Farage, now a radio chat show host, political program, as well as his party's former leader. Our panel. Just before we start, I want to tell you about a new idea that we're introducing in this program, social media. If you send in a question on social media, two things happen. First, we know what is important to you as a listener, although of course you're not here. And second, we have the chance to consider it as a question to put to the panel. As I say, it's an experiment. Why not take part? Just search for Radio 4 on the social media. Let's now go to our first question. James Langmead, how do you feel about your party's performance in the local elections? The stats they have been coming out all over the place. Just to remind ourselves, the Tories won 540 more seats. Labour lost 360 seats. The Lib Dems lost 36 seats. UKIP lost every seat it was defending, but won one from Labour in Lancashire. The projected national share of the vote, as it stands, the Tories on 38%, Labour on 27%, the Lib Dems on 18%, UKIP 5%. That's on the basis of the votes cast, of course. And there was a turnout of just under 29%. So, how do you feel about your party's performance? Uh, Stuart Andrew. Um, well, naturally, I'm very pleased. Uh, I'm pleased that people have been backing Theresa May. Uh, as our Prime Minister. I think that they're backing the fact that she has a plan for Brexit. Brexit. I nearly did breakfast then. No. Um, a plan for Brexit, but she's also... Um, she's you know, presumably got a, got a plan. plan for breakfast as well. <laughs> uh, also got a, a plan for Britain. Um, and I'm pleased that people have gone out and supported her team. Uh, but I think what is really important is that, you know, these were local elections, obviously, and we have got really important general election coming up, and not a single vote has yet been cast for that general election. Um, and on the 8th of June, we as a country have a very big decision to make, and that is to decide who is going to lead our country in these very important negotiations. And so, you know, we are taking nothing for granted because this, I think, is probably one of the most important general elections I can remember in my lifetime. Presumably, uh, the main thing you're saying is you've been downplaying all day and saying, well, we just got through, um, and what you fear is that everyone will think, yeah, it's a Tory landslide, we can stay at home. I think it's fair to say that we want to be absolutely clear to people that if you want Theresa May to be the Prime Minister uh, after the 8th of June, you're going to have to go out and vote for her. Because if complacency uh, on the part of us as a party, which we are not prepared to do, but also if people think that it's a, a sure win for our party, that could be incredibly dangerous. We could end up with Jeremy Corbyn as our Prime Minister, propped up by other political parties, and a coalition of chaos that would oh. really... No, well, you could... I was... You mean... Is no, it, it's it true, a coalition though. of chaos instead of strong and stable Str government, is that it? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, people could laugh, but actually... They do. It is about... It is, it, it is about having a strong and stable leader. Because the, the alternative, the alternative, frankly, is quite terrifying. Because Jeremy Corbyn would have to first negotiate with the leaders of the other par political parties that are propping him up before he can go into negotiation uh, in, with the EU. Thank we you, Emily, Emily Thornbury. We need strong result on June the 8th. Emily Thornbury, how do you view your party's performance? I'm really disappointed. I'm disappointed for all the hard-working councillors that we have who dedicate their lives to representing their community and doing the best for their community. 
And they don't do it by way of some sort of cult of personality or thinking that they're marvelous themselves. It's all about what they do, and it's about what they stand for, and how hard they work, and whether they can be relied on, and whether they're truthful and straightforward. Um, but it's been a, a mixed picture. I mean, there have certainly been areas where we were supposed to do, you know, badly, and we actually haven't. I mean, we had a, a visit from Theresa May in Newport, and you'll remember the Conservatives talked about there being some sort of surge of uh, Tories in, uh, in Wales, which hasn't happened. Um, so some places we've done better than expected, and some places we have not done as well as, as we should. And it's a lesson for us. And we have to redouble our efforts. We, it's, not, it's all to play for. You know, it's not lost. And what we have to do is we have to get out and talk to people. We have 600,000 members. We can get out and talk to people about what it is that the Labour Party stands for. This is not a presidential election. This is about what politics can do to change people's lives. When you close your eyes as a politician, who are you thinking about when you're making decisions? You should we be cutting taxes for the very richest whilst cutting back on police officers, for example? Should we be making nurses pay for their education when we don't have enough nurses? There is another way. It doesn't have to be this way. And we have to get out there and convince people that they, that they should come with us with some hope and we should also be, of course we should be, the party that is able to reset our relationship with the European Union. Okay, because we might come frankly, on to we might it come on to very worrying, it's very worrying. <laughs> Do you share the Shadow Chancellor's view that part of your problem is that uh, Jeremy Corbyn hasn't been seen and heard about enough and that he ought to be out there and when people see him on television, hear him on the radio, see the pictures in the newspapers during his campaign, your uh, position will be hugely strengthened? I think, I mean, I know Jeremy and I've known him since I, I've been an MP now for 12 years and, and so he, he represents the constituency next to me. And I, I know him to be a decent and honourable and straightforward man who believes what he does. That's not, and, quite, that's not quite saying well, what I was asking. I actually think, I well, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a leader who's like that, actually. I think that's a good thing to do. And he is somebody who wants to work in a team. And he doesn't, you know, he, as I say, it's a presidential style is definitely not his. And I think that the more people who get to see this man who says what he means and means what he does, I think that more people would certainly be be attracted to him. Thank you. And Sarah Olney for the Lib Dems. Well, um, I think it's fair to say we probably haven't won the, the number of seats that we hoped for, but what's really encouraging for us is that our vote share has increased uh, by uh, to 18%, which is up 7%, I think, on the last time these seats were fought. So to, to achieve a vote share of 18% is actually very encouraging for us. And not only that, we've done particularly well in some of those areas that we'll be hoping to do well in on June the 8th. So places like uh, Wells and Bath, um, St Albans, East Dumbartonshire, these are all places where you know, we really hope that we can, we can make gains on June the 8th. So the fact that we've done particularly well in those areas um, is something that's very encouraging for us. But it's hardly win winning back the South West, which you used to occupy and which voted, in this context we may come on to the issue of Brexit, um, voted overwhelmingly for Brexit with one or two exceptions, is it? No, um, and I don't think any, we thought that it would, be, uh, it would be easy to retake those places. Um, obviously, we've, we've had a very strong history in the Southwest. We think we've still got um, a lot to offer the people of the Southwest, and we'll be making our case to them very strongly over the next five weeks. Um, but I think one of the, the features of the, the set of local election results is the extent to which the UKIP vote has moved wholesale uh, almost to the Conservatives and I think it's that particular move that we could have I think it's that really if if it hadn't been for that rather uh, we could have expected to have won more seats on the vote share that we gained. Nigel Farage. Well hasn't politics changed in the last couple of years because a party that stood on a manifesto of leaving the European Union controlling immigration helping struggling small and medium-sized businesses and bringing back grammar schools has achieved a huge, resounding, astonishing success. That party wasn't UKIP, but four years ago, that was UKIP's manifesto for these local elections. And what has happened here is all the things 
that I've been accused of banging on about for the last 20 years or more on this programme have now been adopted wholesale by Theresa May, the Prime so Minister. So the question was, how do you uh, view the performance of your party? We have transformed... We have transformed in the elections. the landscape elections. of British politics in a way that no party within living memory has ever done. Okay. And the fact that UKIP has done badly in these elections actually doesn't matter. What matters is this country is now having the right debate. Okay. Um, we'll go to our next question, please, which Geraint goes directly Williams. to the point you were just making. Sorry. Yeah, Geraint Williams. So what is the point of UKIP now? Uh, and, and I should say that we've had a large number of social media uh, questions of the same kind on Twitter. Nigel, did you expect it, i.e. the wipeout? And is the game over for UKIP now? And Skylar Baker Jordan, given the results of the local elections and Theresa's passion for a hard Brexit, what is the point of UKIP as a political party? That was on Twitter as well. Um, I'm not going to come to you first, uh, Nigel. I'll go to Emily oh. Thornbray. <laughs> I'd like to hear what they, I'm sure the audience would like to hear what they think the point of UKIP is, and then you'll have a chance. I think this is a very important point, which is that I think that the Theresa May has been trying to move the Conservative Party into occupying UKIP territory. And we need to see what that therefore means in terms of where the Conservative Party is going. So I think the level of Euroscepticism I think is very alarming to many moderate people who normally vote Conservative, many of whom, in fact, want to wanted to remain in the European Union. And even those who wanted to leave didn't, certainly didn't want us to have a punch-up with the Europeans and to go marching off in a half, which is kind of what, what, the, the, what it is, the card that she is playing. Can Frankly, I, can when I, sorry, she stood... I would ask you, I would ask you no. because you don't know what the questions okay. are that are coming up. Some of them okay. deal with what you went on to talk about okay. when uh, Gerard right, Williams so me... wants to know what is the point of you. So let now. me go back to it. So the point is this, is that, is that what has happened in my view is that, is that the Conservatives are trying to subsume um, UKIP and trying to, and trying to as, as, as Nigel has already said, include all of their policies and I think that has meant that the Conservative Party has had a move to the right and do not represent the centre ground now and do not represent mainstream public opinion in many ways and I find it alarming. And do you think UKIP... <laughs> do you think UKIP is now, whether you like UKIP or not, it's actually redundant? Given, well, the, I mean, given the power that you claimed it has. Well, I think what's, what's kind of interesting is that when you, when you ask some UKIP people, they say, oh, you know, we're, we're not standing in particular seats where there are people who are, who are very anti, um, any, having anything to do with the European Union. So Paul Nuttall, for example, they're not going to stand against, against him. Um, they're not going to stand in particular seats and so on. And then they go on to say, oh, but we're not just about, uh, we're not just about uh, leaving the European Union. You know, it seems that we're about, we're about ensuring that young women who have been travelling around the world before they're allowed to come back to Britain have to be have to be examined by a doctor to find out whether or not their their clitoris has been cut I mean it's just I mean some of the stuff is disgusting some of the stuff that they're coming out with is disgusting and and if the if UKIP still want to be rep, want to be stirring up um, the sort of the sort of uh, uh, intolerance of, of difference then I hope that there is no further place for them Nigel Farage well, in answer to the question, did I expect the results yesterday? Yeah, completely. Of course. Of course. Because, as I say, we, I mean, Theresa May literally, not only is she using the same words and phrases I've used for 20 years, she's even attacking Brussels bureaucrats on the steps of number 10. So I did expect this completely. Uh, what is the point of UKIP? Well, history will say that without UKIP, we would never have had that referendum. We'd never have left the European Union. Going on from here, we have a Prime Minister who is very good at giving the big set piece speech. Very good at making the big promise, just as she was as the longest serving Home Secretary uh, for 150 years, and actually on immigration in particular, she failed completely. To think that UKIP has no future in politics is rather like any of you in this room thinking there's no point paying the house insurance because the chances of having a fire next year are very limited. But if you it have is no, a if stupid, have, it is a stupid thing to do. If you have no, I if suspect, you have no, Nigel, if you yeah. have no uh, council seats, if you are lucky, maybe, but you know, your leader is standing, you're running 100 candidates. If you have maybe one, possibly two, I don't know, 
members of parliament, that means you're there as a sort of movement, a protest movement outside, geeing up conservative MPs to make sure that from their perspective, your perspective, that she doesn't deliver if, a result that a lot of other people would like. If, no in, way, if no in two way, years' time, if in two years' time, she has been as successful as Prime Minister with her promises, as she was as Home Secretary, then I think UKIP will be bigger than it's ever been before. If she delivers on Brexit, then there will be an existential question about UKIP's future. We do not know the answer to this yet, but it is very, very important that the UKIP voice is still there in politics. A majority of this country, and now a big majority, want Brexit, something like 70%, now want Brexit to be a success. Uh, there is, there is, there well, is. Maybe not. Maybe not amongst the Radio 4 audience, oh, but you know, 70% you know, of the country say, we voted for Brexit, let's make a success of it. There's, if, there are a number of statistics, as you are very familiar with, and I say in passing that this audience is self-selecting, it comes here, lives in this area, and around maybe it's come further afield, we don't uh, lay down any kind of rules, and therefore one might presume a lot of them do listen to Radio 4, but we can't say for certain. They may be listening for the very first time to your voice. But the statistical point is surely Lucky this, that, that while 48% voted uh, for Remain and over 50% voted for Stay, and most people by the polls seem to want to get whatever the best result is, what that result is, as delivered as best, there's no unity about that, is there? You wouldn't say everyone agrees it should be hard Brexit or everyone should agree no, that we should be no, out of the single market. No, no, market. no, but there are, there are, you know, I mean, basically, you, you know, a third of those that voted Remain now say, we live in a democracy, let's get on with it and make the best job of it we okay. possibly can. Uh, the, just one more thing. Uh, your great mate, uh, Aaron Banks, with whom he told us in this programme once he went skinny dipping with you after a night of drinking, or something like that, I don't want to be defamatory. And what's wrong with that? Right? <laughs> So I wasn't being defamatory, good. Well, because I can't do any damage to you, at least on that front. Um, uh, he says that the problem is Nuttall's leadership. Do you agree with him? No, I think Paul's a very decent fellow who inherited UKIP at a very difficult time. Uh, two reasons why. One, the Prime Minister has taken our agenda. And two, I was, for many, many years, a dominant, or my critics would say domineering figure, running UKIP, and it's always tough to step into shoes like that. Is... UKIP redundant. What's the point of, of UKIP now? That was a really sw <laughs> swinging endorsement, wasn't it? Um, Sarah, Sarah Olney. Um, I don't think there's any point whatsoever to UKIP anymore. Um, anybody who... Uh... Anybody who wants to vote for a, a nationalist, Eurosceptic, anti-immigrant agenda can just vote Conservative now, and there's no point... <laughs> And we, we, we start to, to tally up the balance sheet for UKIP now, and we see they've got no MPs. Um, to the extent, obviously, all the parties have no MPs right at the moment, but they had no MPs at the end of the Parliament. Uh, uh, very few councillors, and obviously even fewer since last night. Um, thanks to the referendum result, there will very soon be no MEPs for any party. Um, so I would be very happy to think that we're finally seeing... Um, you know, the end of UKIP and that they, they, don't, uh, they don't play any, any major part in British politics in the future. I think that would be that would, that would definitely be uh, uh, an upside to take from last night's well, results. Having won, Sarah, having won, having transformed British politics and hopefully UKIP led Britain didn't win. out UKIP of won. the European Union. That wouldn't be too bad, would it? Um, I'm going to bring in the political uh, party. Conservative uh, Vice Chairman Stuart Andrew. Um, well, I think the What's first... the point of UKIP? Because you've bitten their agenda and are taking it. Well, I, I line think the first thing, is, the first thing is what I'd, Nigel Farage says. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd want to clarify is that actually people who voted Conservative yesterday came from a range of different uh, political views. Um, we have been seeing people coming over to us from the Labour Party. In the west of England, we won the mayoral mer election there because Lib Dems came and voted Conservative. Um, so, but in terms of UKIP, I think... But frankly, sorry, just, just before, just before just yep. again, the statistics can be played all sorts of ways. The overwhelming evidence of the experts in analysing these uh, 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 outcomes judged that a very large proportion of the UKIP voters at the last locals and last election voted 
for the Conservatives, went back to uh, the Conservatives because they clearly believed that you were going to do what Nigel Farage had promised to do. But what I'm saying is you may have listened to a load of experts. I've been out on the doorsteps in my constituency in the north of England and I'm hearing Labour voters saying that they do not trust Jeremy Corbyn and that they are going to vote Conservative. It is true. Let me bring in Emily just on that one point. It is true that uh, a number of Labour, traditional Labour voters went to UKIP, as everyone knows, and they didn't come back to Labour. On the contrary, they've all gone to the Tories, which is presumably a commentary on Corbyn's leadership. Well, or it's your leadership. Well, we need, to, we need to win them back. Of course we do. Of course we need to win them back. And we need, to make sure, we need to make it clear to people that we are the party of working people, that we will look after them, that it is the, that we are their natural home. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Stuart Andrew. Well, uh, the point I was going to say is that, you know, the words that I've heard from others today is that UKIP are a spent force. And it's hardly surprising because they have been embroiled in huge internal arguments and fights. Uh, Paul Nuttall, frankly, is, is not... Uh, uh, cutting the mustard as it were, he's not reaching out to people uh, in the same way, dare I say, that Nigel used to. Uh, and I think actually people realise that these elections, both the local elections and more importantly the general election, are about a serious choice of who is going to lead this country. Okay. And that's okay. why those... We can leave that there because you've said that fringe. already. We're going to move on now to our next question with a reminder of the Any Answers number. Anita Arnand, of course, will be there. The number 03 700 100 444. The lines incidentally open at 12.30 and I know they're extremely busy at this election period. You can email any.answers at bbc.co.uk. The tweet, hashtag BBCAQ or follow us at BBC. Any questions? To our next, please. Does the panel think that being a bloody difficult woman will be the best approach to achieve the best Brexit deal? This was the uh, thought attributed by Ken Clark originally, which uh, the Prime Minister picked up on and said she could be what Ken Clark said she was. Uh, Sarah Olney. Um, no, I don't think so, actually. I think, um, you know, to go into a negotiation, particularly uh, such a critical um, and, and, you know, carefully balanced negotiation as this, you need an open mind, you need, you need generosity of spirit, you need, to, you need to be building good relations with the people that you're, you're negotiating with. Um, I think Theresa May has started off on exactly the wrong foot uh, with these negotiations. I don't think that being... I don't think that being a, a bloody difficult woman in this circumstance is anything remotely to be proud of and actually will cause her more problems, create more difficulties for the country as a whole. And, and I am, I'm extremely dismayed, actually, by, by the rhetoric, particularly when she stood on the steps of Downing Street earlier this week and talked about how the EU were deliberately undermining the general election. I just I thought that was horrifying, actually. Um, I mean, we've heard a great deal... Um, I'm sure you've all heard a great deal, as much as I have, about the strong and stable leadership that we're being promised. Um, and it seems to me that actually far from being strong, and, or her interpretation of being strong and stable is actually being stubborn and intransigent. And I just... <laughs> I'm afraid I just don't think that's going to bring us the deal that we need. Nigel Farage. With the exception of Margaret Thatcher at Fontainebleau in 1984, Every attempt by British Prime Ministers to renegotiate a better deal or to do their very best with their friends in the Foreign Office has been a failure. You know, uh, Tony Blair, uh, David Cameron. And what you have to understand is that we're not dealing with normal democratically elected governments. We're dealing with the European Union. We're dealing with people who have vast amounts of power, big budgets, who have not been elected, who can't be removed, who are now petrified for their future. They're scared because Euroscepticism is growing in every single country in Europe. And frankly, uh, these are bad people. They are anti-democratic. They are against the existence of a nation state. They are thugs. They are bullies. And they will do. Yep. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, we are, dealing with, we are dealing with a very, very unpleasant, extreme form of EU nationalism. And to stand up to that and to fight that the British Prime Minister has not just to say, but make it clear that if they're not prepared to follow the route of economic logic, which is actually, we are a very important trading partner for all these people, and we want to be grown up and have the best possible relations, but to, to interfere 
in Gibraltar to stoke the fires of Irish nationalism, which I think is disgusting actually, to demand a leaving bill. Now, I, I believe it's now 100 billion euros. They're not behaving reasonably. Okay. May must make it clear, unless they play with a straight bat, we will simply walk away. Emily Thornberry. Emily. I'm sorry, what? No, your, your turn to answer the question. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I have quite a lot to say about this. Um, I think that... Confine yourself to the available time, if you would. I was ashamed to see the Prime Minister come back from seeing the Queen and standing on the steps of Number 10 Downing Street and saying what she said. I think that she is either deluded and paranoid or she is deeply manipulative. I think that to claim that there is a conspiracy in the European Union to try to interfere in the results of the election that she called herself that she didn't need is extraordinary. I think that in fact what she's likely to be doing is being manipulative and it is manipulating British public opinion against the European Union and against our European partners in order to try to get into the bed with Euro UKIP because it is to her, it is to her uh, electoral advantage, she decides. And that, I think, is very worrying because I think that it not only divides us, but it also plays fast and loose with our economy. Yes, we're leaving the European Union, but there are different ways you can leave the European Union. And what you have to do is you have to put front and centre the safety and security of your citizens. And secondly, you have to look after the economy, which means that you have to look after people's jobs. It are our children's jobs she's do you, with. Do you, do, you, do you accept yourself as the uh, uh, chief negotiator, Mr Barnier, is saying that there does have to be a settlement of the divorce terms, not in final detail, but it has to be a settlement, the money that's paid, the EU citizens in this country, that that has to be achieved before it's possible to talk about trade. Do you, do you accept I, that EU position? Yeah, I mean, what I find so extraordinary is 10 months on from the referendum, we're still arguing about what we're going to be discussing first. How incompetent can we be? If there is, as we hope, as a result of this general election, we get a different government, Labour will reset our relationship with Europe, and we will actually start talking to people properly, talking to people as partners, and making sure we have a strong Brexit, and a strong Brexit means a Brexit which is good for Britain and good for Britain's economy and good for Britain's security and we will be doing that by persuading the Europe that there is a problem that we can find a solution together we don't find it by stamping our feet and saying that we're going to march off off to the into the middle of the Atlantic if we don't get what we want remember she okay. has threatened she has threatened not to be involved in security relationships with the rest of Europe you know, that was what was in the article 50 letter and before that she threatened that if she didn't get a deal she would tell turn us into a tax haven sailing off the coast of Europe and she thought that would threaten the Europeans but actually it threatens us as Britain because we know as night follows day a low tax economy means an economy okay, that cannot okay, afford okay. the National Health Service. Okay. Um. <laughs> this, uh, this, Stuart, did, did you know that she was a bloody difficult woman before she told you she was in public and us? <laughs> I'm not answering that question. Um, let me just say, put it this way. Um, from what I have seen of, of uh, Theresa May, she uh, is a very determined woman. And, you know, I hear what Emily's saying, but the words that I heard of her speak in, on the streets of Downing Street were actually passionate and determined because she wants to get a, and she's absolutely determined to get a good deal for Britain uh, in these negotiations. But she's also said that she wants to get a good deal for the EU too. Uh, and I think that that is in the, all of our interests that she uh, secures that. And Emily says that uh, the Labour Party, uh, you know, will, will seek a different narrative. We frankly don't know what their plan is. No, no, let's, Keir let's, Starmer, let's, no, let's, no, Keir Starmer let's, even let's, told Jeremy Corbyn. And your white paper has 666 Keir, promises. Keir Starmer, we have said your Brexit. No, 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 hold, hold, on, you. hold on, you both of you. Both you. you. Keir like, Starmer, you, you who know, is your Brexit spokesperson, he even said that Jeremy, Cor uh, Jeremy Corbyn didn't have the leadership skills for Brexit. So how on earth can the rest of the nation have faith in him in to go into these negotiations? Can we come well, back, can we come back, if we could, to the question that Brian Judge puts? The approach that she's adopting, you say, is a good approach. You say that she uh, is uh, strong, that she is determined. 
If she persists in saying to the European Union, which in the end calls the shots, we will, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, we will not settle the divorce terms first, and that leads to uh, leaving on WTO terms. Are you, is, that a, is that an outcome that you would regard as acceptable? Well, I, 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 in fairness, the EU have sort of contradicted themselves because at one point they said that the, uh, the, the bill that we have to pay has to be sorted before there would be a trade uh, negotiation. But then they said, as you've just said, nothing will be decided until everything's decided. No, no, so sorry, what that's what they, they didn't say. They didn't say that. And I don't yes, think they I did. Said, excuse me. I think what I said... Quoting her, Mrs May, is that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. That's Mrs May's position. On the question of divorce settlements, yet again uh, this week, several times, the European Union has made it clear that from their perspective, the 27 members represented by the, by the Commission are saying there will be no settlement unless we can agree the divorce terms first. The money, the money. Hmm. Is that something that you accept has to be the case, or do you believe that you can still seek to, as I think the Prime Minister has also recently said, we can negotiate trade at the same time? Because that means unpass, doesn't it? But, the, but there have been no figures announced yet. We've heard various figures within the last month. Uh, so it's impossible to have that. And the negotiations haven't even started properly yet. So I, what I would say is that there's a lot of gossip, there's a lot of speculation going on. What we need to get down to are the real negotiations. And we need somebody who has the ability to go into that uh, negotiation with a strong hand. And that's why this election is so incredibly important, so that we have our Prime Minister, knowing that she has the backing of our country, going in to fight for the very best deal for every part of the United Kingdom. Emily Thornbury? What worries me is that actually what Theresa May wants is she wants a blank cheque. She wants to be able to get rid of the opposition so that no one will be holding her to account and so that she can go and do whatever she wants with our country when it comes to the Brexit negotiations. And it isn't just Brexit, it's also what she can, what she can do whatever she wants in terms of the National Health Service or anything else. And we say no. And we say no. And we say that when the, the Tories to just turn this back on or let's have another pop at Jeremy Corbyn. The people who will be leading the Brexit negotiations if Labour is in power will be Keir Starmer and will be me as Foreign Secretary. That's an unequivocal promise. So that means Jeremy That's an unequivocal Cor promise that you will be Foreign Secretary. Well, if we're, if we're elected, then hopefully. Emily, yeah. Obviously, case, it's subject to what, what, Jeremy subject what Jeremy be? says. I mean, would you stay in the single market? Would you leave the single market? Because no, I don't I tell, the, all right, continue. I don't let you, let me answer those for. two questions. I know what the Tories are saying. What do you stand for? Because okay. it's, so, it's very confusing. Yeah, just so, well, would you stay in the single market? Just let's, 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 let's try No, we would not stay in the single market because our view is that our economy is too large and too complex to be able to stay in the single market the same way in which other smaller countries that are close to the European Union are. We need to have a free trade deal, but we need to have a free trade deal that keeps us as close as possible to the European Union. That means having, ta that means having red tape free and incumbent free access to the single market, which means putting the economy first and deciding around that and looking first and foremost at jobs. We have to remain close to the European Union whilst, of course, leaving the European Union, but we have set out six tests. So does that we mean free movement out, as well, then? Yeah. That the, means the, the, that the, the, if the, we're leaving the European Union, then, then we have to change freedom of movement and of course that was part of the the the, the referendum and do part you of the believe, debate do you but believe, we need to prioritize the the economy first and foremost does labor believe that you can get free trade on the terms that are beneficial to britain uh, with and not have free movement again i put to you that the that the european commissioner said this very day mr barnier has said uh, free movement is an absolute Free movement is an absolute, it's fundamental. I understand that. And if we wanted to remain within the single market, then we would have to have free movement. That's why we need to move out of the single market, but also because our economy is too complex in any event for us to be in this kind of quasi-relationship. I've spoken to the Norwegians about this, and it's simply, you know, they have said to us, they have a very simple economy in terms of fish and, 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 uh, and agriculture, and they can have the relationship they do, but we simply couldn't have the Norwegian model. We would have to have a British model. We would have to. Now, the next question would be, do we remain in the customs union? And that is a more difficult, a difficult issue. And what's your one view? That we need to what's Labour's view? 
Well, I think that we have to, the, the advantages of remaining in the customs union are very strong indeed, and we would need to take a we serious look at that. We voted to leave, Emily. No, 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 no. To leave. We voted to leave the European Union. And if you shouldn't be clearer. Uh, uh, we need uh, to, if, if you but stay, we did not vote for the, for the county of Kent to be a, to be a, a, a park for lorries that are, that, are, that are having all of their items checked one way or the other because we're outside the customs if union. You remain Our inside, food industry will be decimated if, if we're outside inside, the customs union. If you remain union. inside the customs union, as I'm sure you know, you are therefore yeah. bound by the EU terms of trade with other nations. You're quite happy to accept that which the that's Tories why, don't. That's why, we have, that's why we have said that we need to be outside the single market, but we need to look very carefully about the, at the okay. pros and cons in relation to the customs union. But, you know, if we leave the customs union, it has a devastating effect on, on, the, on, the, on, on the direction of travel that Ireland has been taking, north and south of Ireland, because how can we continue to have a soft border and be outside the customs union? Any answers again, of course, uh, for any of you who wish to comment on any of that. 03 700 100 444. We're going to move swiftly to our next, and perhaps we can deal with it swiftly. I don't know. Let's try. Please. I'm Gislen Barry, and I would like to ask, will Brexit be harder or easier if we wake up on Monday to find Marine Le Pen president of France? Uh, uh, do you have... Your, 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 your French accent is absolutely yes. faultless. Do you have French in your... <laughs> okay. Um, Nigel, Nigel F Farage, um, I've, you're, you're quite a fan, aren't you? Do you know, I've sat, I've sat for 18 years in the European Parliament and at no time have I ever wanted UKIP to do a deal with the French National Front for lots and lots of reasons, Vichy, anti-Semitism, you name it. Since she took over in 2011, she has taken that party in a different direction. She has now done a deal ahead of Sunday with a guy called de Pontignan, who's a very respectable Conservative. I very much hope she wins. I don't think she will win, but I very much hope she wins against the globalist Macron. OK, but, we're but, going to but, keep but, this short. about one thing. What is best for Britain? What is best for Brexit Britain? Is it Macron who will support the EU bullying and threats of this country, or is it Le Pen who told me herself when I interviewed her for a rival radio station that she wanted to have a sensible free trade deal with the United Kingdom. Le Pen would be best for this country if she becomes president. I'll make a prediction. She won't win this Sunday, but she will in 2022. Um, uh, Sarah Olney. Just briefly, will it make it harder or easier were she to be? The polls are suggesting she won't be, but as we know, the polls can be wrong, if it were the case. Harder or easier for the Prime Minister of the day, and let us assume for the purposes of this argument, it's Mrs May. Uh, well, I think Le Pen has made it perfectly clear that she wants to put France first in everything and doesn't really, uh, doesn't really agree with sort of international cooperation. So I think um, the more countries that start to close in upon, uh, upon themselves and, and take this more nationalist, uh, inward-looking stance, the more difficult it becomes for everybody. Uh, in terms of Brexit, I actually think it would be harder to achieve a good deal um, if Le Pen is, is elected president, because I think, um, it, you know, the, 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 the more this sort of nationalist feeling is stoked up amongst uh, the European, uh, within the European Union countries, the more difficult it then becomes for those, those countries that remain within the European Union to, to develop uh, good relationships. And I just think that will have a, a negative impact on the continent Because as they a whole. want to be even tougher to stop the disintegration, you're saying, are you? They want to be even tougher on the Brexit... Mm. I think so, ultimately, because, you know, they want to look after their own interests as, as a club of nations. OK. Um, Stuart Andrew, more difficult, easier for a Prime Minister? I think that we have to face the fact that these are going to be tough negotiations, whoever is in charge. Um, this so it is... makes no difference whether she or he wins? I'm, well, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I, I don't really want to comment on the internal elections of other countries. I think they've had a bit of a problem with that happening uh, in our country with other nations uh, leaking information that wasn't necessary, frankly. So are you cool about it either way? I'm, look, I'm not comfortable with any sort of far-right organisation, frankly. Um, and you do but... regard... <laughs> No. No. And you regard, to, you I, regard, I, I, we are not. And Marine Le Pen, you do regard as a far leader of a far right. Well, party. I think historically they certainly have been, and they, there are some, some extremist views there that are, are not comfortable with me at all. Thank you. And finally, on this, Emily Thornbury, and briefly, if you'd be so kind. 
I think that uh, I don't, it, is, it is a tradition that we don't interfere in the elections of other countries, but frankly, I'm quite happy to make an exception here. Um, I think that the French people have a stark choice between a, an inclusive and tolerant vision of France and, and, and a chance to, to vote for optimism over fear. Um, a vision that's actually hopeful and looks to the future and thinks it can be better and that we can be proper internationalists and we can work together and we shouldn't be afraid of one another. So, of course, Macron is better for France and, of course, Macron is better for Europe and, indeed, better for Britain. Thank you. And we'll go to our next, please. Colin Redshaw. How does the panel view Prince Philip's contribution to the monarchy and the country? Prince Philip's contribution, how, how do you view it, Sarah Olney? Uh, he's obviously been, um, his, in, in a way, his, his life has been almost, I think, completely unique. And um, if there was one thing I would really like him to spend his retirement doing, I'm sure he won't be allowed to, but I would love to read his memoirs, because he must have... He must have seen so many things. He must have met all the, you know, all the most important and interesting people of the 20th century. He's been everywhere. He's seen everything. Um, so, you know, that's just an extraordinary uh, role to have played um, in, in, in history, really. Um, he's obviously been um, an extraordinary support to the Queen. Um, and they have, um, as a couple been uh, at the very forefront of British life for such a long time. So um, I think he'll be missed, and I, uh, I you know, wish him well for his retirement. <laughs> you've, only, you've, of course, only seen him in, in old age, relative old age. Will you miss him? In, not in your old age, his old age, <laughs> as he'd be the very first to acknowledge. Um, Will you miss him? Well, I, I think, but I mean, I th because, because they have been, uh, the, both um, the Queen and Prince Philip have been such um, a presence on, on the national stage for such a long time, uh, it's difficult to, um, I think most people won't be able to remember a time when they weren't. So I think in, in that sense, we'll, we'll all miss him. It'll be um, a figure suddenly missing from our, um, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but from our national wallpaper almost, you know, because he's been part of, of, of the, the national scene for such a long time time. Thank you. Uh, Nigel Farage. For an alpha male, World War II naval officer to be one or two steps behind for decade after decade after decade, the way that he's done in support of the Queen, I think his contribution to the monarchy, to this country, to the Commonwealth has been phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Remarkable. Uh, I admire him hugely. I really do. And I... All I will say is, with him retiring from public life, I shall miss his one-liners terribly. <laughs> Emily Thornbury. Um, I think that uh, we should all acknowledge his tremendous commitment to public service and to the way in which he served our country, and his support to the Queen has been obvious. You know, you sometimes meet people, and there's this phrase, isn't there, they've got a good marriage. And you can see there's something in the chemistry of the two of them that is clear that they have a, a close and supportive relationship. I think that you know, people will miss him, but I imagine that uh, the Queen will probably miss him and not having him by her, her side in the way that she has. I'm, um, I'm pleased to see that Nigel Farage is praising an immigrant and the <laughs> contribution that an immigrant has made to Britain. I, I thought you were planning on a, an elaboration. You weren't. <laughs> will you, uh, the same questions I put to Sarah, will you, will you miss him? If yes. Not yeah. being there and thereabouts on stage, as it were, performing? Yes, of course. Of course we will, we'll all miss him. Um, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he was uh, always somewhat unpredictable uh, as well, which uh, always added a certain frisson to, uh, to meeting <laughs> the, uh, the Queen and, uh, and uh, Prince Philip. Stuart Andrew. Well, I think his contribution has been, frankly, extraordinary. Um, you know, let's not forget that this, this man had a, uh, uh, as, as Nigel referred to, had a, a Royal Navy career that could have taken him right to the very top. Uh, and he put all that to one side to support our Queen. Um, and I think one of the moments where you got one of those rare uh, glimpses of what the public thought about him 
was at the Queen's Jubilee concert where he was obviously too ill to be there and was in hospital and they, the crowd wanted to send their best wishes to him and you could hear that roar of appreciation. He's clearly been a, a magnificent support to, to the Queen in the duties that she has to perform uh, and has helped make sure that our uh, monarchy has been able to adapt through some very different ages and through some very troubling times. Thank you. And let me ask you put the, the question, Colin Redshaw. Well, I, I think he's been phenomenal, I, particularly as he didn't really want the job. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I think at times he's, he's been a breath of fresh air and common sense, particularly, if you forgive me, when we've been listening to politicians so, so often. <laughs> he's often put a, a common sense point of view. And I, I also think that um, his legacy, I guess, will be the Duke of Edinburgh scheme, which yes. is a, yeah, an amazing thing yeah, for young no, people. I mean, yeah. I don't, I, just to, before we finish this program, which we're about to do, just to, to go to our audience on this simple question. Um, who will, as it were, miss him no longer performing his public duties? Would you put your hands up? His presence on the stage, who will miss him? Anyone who won't miss him at all? Well, there, is, there, there are some who won't miss him. That's inevitable that I have to say here in Hurstbury Point there is a large majority of those in this audience who will miss him. And that brings us to the end of this week's programme. With a I don't know about some bright new fresh start for Europe. It looks a bit more like the knacker's yard for failed domestic politicians.